Tonight's topic is collaboration. Um, it's our goal to explore some of the different types of relationships that result in collaboration across the flameworking spectrum and with other disciplines. The discussion topics will include, what is the role of collaboration in your practice? How do you negotiate a collaboration? What platforms do you use for collaboration? What kinds of collaboration would you like to see in the future? And what are some examples of ultimate collaboration scenarios that you might like to see? Additionally, uh, some other kind of offshoot questions. How can collaboration be useful in expanding the field? And what can collaboration look like within the flameworking community? And then also facing outward, um, interfacing with other disciplines. So we will follow up with consolidated and edited notes from this meeting and share it to the Flame Chat Google group, which you'll be added to if you've joined tonight's discussion. Tonight's discussion. So you can look out for that. And, um, and a, just a final reminder to, if you're able to, please uh, throw some support towards Geeks. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much. And we'll continue now with, we'll unshare the screen here and continue on with our programming for tonight. Ah, everybody's faces, hi. All right. Okay, thank you all for joining us. I am going to uh, drop in the chat just a few links, geeks related links for us all. Okay. And I'm going to also put in here a link to the resource exchange, which has all kinds of archives for um, for flame working that you may find useful. So if you have not taken a look at that, um, please do when you have a when you have a chance. There's just all kinds of really great resources in there. <clears throat> OK, and so just to note, um, we're going to wrap, try to wrap it up tonight in about an hour and a half. But some of sometimes on our meetings, like discussions really good. We might end up sticking around a little longer. So I just wanted to let you know that. If you need to leave early, that's totally fine, but we just want to make sure that everyone's voices are heard. And so we may end up lingering a little bit past that time. So just to kind of let you know what our um, our plan is here. So thank you so much again for, for joining us tonight, uh, the Flame Affinity Group. Um, tonight's topic is collaboration. And I just wanted to start off by saying thank you so much everyone for joining us because this whole meeting and this whole project of the Flame Affinity Group is a collaboration. And it really relies on everybody's participation to kind of make it work. So um, so thank you all. And in that light, um, this will be an open discussion on the different types of collaboration that occur within the field of flame working, uh, including projects within the community, and then also cross-pollinating with other disciplines. Um, so today we'd like to explore some of the different types of relationships that result in collaboration across the flame working spectrum and beyond. Um, and also kind of brainstorm about what are some possibilities to use collaboration to further the field and what are some ultimate acts of collaboration that you would like to see? I know there was recently just a pretty high profile collab um, between um, Coil, Hoobs, and who was the third person? Over at Corning Museum of Glass. I'm gonna drop the link in the um, chat here so you can right check now? that out. Um, Rhino, yes, thank you. Um, and so that was really an interesting, um, very public demonstration of the way that flameworking, I see a lot uh, collaboration being used within the flameworking field to put together large projects and also to kind of like share skill sets um, and to come up potentially with like new work that would be beyond the scope of one artist's ability to make. Um, and those are just my impressions on like, you know, some of the impact of this collaboration, but it was just so great to see, um, to see a collaboration like that happen in such a public way. And it was really groundbreaking. Um, so I'm sharing the, the blog from CMOG for you all. So if you're not aware of that collab, you can check it out. It was a really amazing piece that was made out of it. Um, so tonight, uh, the way that we like to format this meeting is I will start it off. And um, let me introduce myself. I haven't already done it. My name is Amy Lemaire, and I'm an artist and an educator. And um, I'd also like to introduce you to my co-facilitator tonight, Madeline Ryle Smith. Um, and we will be facilitating the, the discussion tonight. 
And so um, we have a series of prompts um, that we will kind of work with tonight to kind of keep the discussion organized. And so um, what I would ask for you to do is to keep your, yourself muted. Uh, and then if you would like to, there's two ways for you to address the group. One is you can work the chat. And the other is if you would like to address the group, the group verbally, then you can use the hand raise function. And, um, and I will call on you. I'm going to facilitate the first half of the meeting. And then in the middle, we'll switch and Madeline will take us home for the second half. And we will call on you um, so that we can kind of speak one at a time and everybody can be heard. So um, and the whole time, you can work the chat as well. Um, so let's begin. Um, so our first, our first um, question here is, um, you know, some of you we know already, and some uh, some people are new to the group tonight. So um, what I'd like to ask is, please uh, please introduce yourself and tell us if you use collaboration in your practice, and if you don't use or not able to use collaboration in your practice, what does what does collaboration mean to you? Um, how do you think about it? What's important about it? Are you inspired by collaboration? Um, so we'd like to kind of hear. Uh, hear a little bit from the group here about how you think about collaboration. And of course, if you have any active, like any firsthand experience, um, we'd love for you to share some of those stories. So I'll start. Um, my name's Amy Lemaire, and I'm an artist and an educator based in Brooklyn. And I'm currently working on a collaboration. I collaborate a lot in my work through teaching and then also in my studio practice. And currently, I'm working on a, um, a collaboration with Nicholas Tehran, who is a, uh, a ceramic artist who works with 3D printed porcelain. And so we are doing a collaboration and I am, we have kind of a, a shared visual language um, and we're interested in, in exploring that together and making like a totally new body of work that's neither mine nor his, but kind of is like this third entity. Um, it's very experimental and it's a lot of fun. Um, so, so that's currently um, one of the ways that I'm using collaboration in my practice. Um, so at this point, I'd like to open it up and see if, um, uh, if anybody would like to share with us uh, what you think about collaboration or if anybody's engaged in collaboration. Samantha, please unmute yourself. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Um, so I actually have a new music uh, glass blower, and um, I use it to make things that I don't feel comfortable making myself yet. So like I'm trying to do the hollow work. Samantha, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we're having a little bit of a hard time hearing you. Would you be able to maybe move a little closer to the mic? Okay, that might be better. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. Way way better. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Continue. So, um, yeah, for me, it's um, it's being able to produce things that I'm not yet comfortable producing because I'm kind of a new artist. So I'm not um, great yet at hollow work. Um, it's something that I'm kind of just really starting to get a little better at. So um, like I'm going to be vending a show and I'm really, I've really perfected kind of uh, implosions and, and little hearts and mermaid tails and different things like that. So I actually will send that to a friend of mine and he'll make spoons and put my little trinkets like on the spoons. And now I have a brand new product that I can sell at a market where if I was gonna make it, it would look really terrible. So um, that's how I use collaboration, but nobody wants to really collaborate with me yet. I'm not good enough. <laughs> so thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much. Well, that's a great use of collaboration. You can kind of expand your skill set by collaborating with somebody else who has a complementary skill set. Um, thanks so much. All right, uh, Davis. Hey, I'm Davis. Um, I'm a teacher in Philly. I do hot shop and flame working, and I don't collaborate very much besides when I'm teaching. And during the uh, the demonstrations, when we all collaborate on one big piece, are some of the best times and the, my favorite times. 
but I specifically started flame working to do independent work and do it as frequently as I can, not based off of schedules and whatnot. So I'm interested in seeing this meeting because of how I can engage in collaboration more because I feel like I don't that often and it's a little intimidating as well. Or just like sometimes I'm worried about things not fitting really well. So I'm excited to see about different perspectives on that. Great. Thank you so much, Davis. Anjali. Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, okay. So uh, how I think of collaborations, I think collaborations are very, for me, a very conscious and very like consensual uh, agreements with someone else who has either a different background or different life experience, a different skill set, a different field of expertise, different cultural context, just something that's not me, something mm -hmm. that's bigger than me. Um, and it's not something that just happens. It's something that we agree to bring to the table in specific ways. Um, and collaboration for me is also not predetermined as a result. It is about these two or more than two things coming together and then creating something that could never be done by one person. You know, so it's it's sort of like I, I think collaboration for me generates new knowledge, if I if I could if I could use that word. Um, and that's how I think about it. Um, and that's why I'm curious about it. That's why I'm interested in it, because it makes me feel very small and appropriately small, the scale of the universe, and I like that. Um, it's also sort of defeating the sort of um, um, man as an island soloist, I'm all self-sufficient act that modernism put together. So, you know, I'm kind of like really into collaboration. Um, um, I usually collaborate with scientists. <laughs> That's my, um, uh, I make a lot of art science work um, and uh, I don't have, you know what? I, I can't claim to be a flame worker just as I cannot claim to be a glass blower. I know these things, but it's not like I'm great at anything. Um, but I am very interested in networking within the realm of flame working and what it allows for metaphors of networking and community building to do. Um, so my interest in um, collaborative flame working is a project I've been doing where I invite non glass makers to use map gas with very thin borer rods to build structures that are not predetermined. And it has allowed, and it's not like, oh my God, great artistic creation, or maybe it is. Um, it's literally a space that glass making creates where people can talk about differences. And I find that sort of cultural capital building really valuable through flame working, which is way more accessible than glass blowing. So that, that's sort of why I'm here. It was a long thing, sorry. That was awesome. No, thank you so much. Yeah, I, I do a, a similar community building with beads and the act of making beads as well. But um, Anjali, if, do you have a link to your projects that you might be able to share with us? Because I think with the chat, I, one of the things we're trying to do tonight is is compile links that we can put sure. in the resource exchange. So if you have yeah, I'll drop one. I'll find it. the I'll find the little video thingy and put it in there. Great, thank you. Yep. Oh, there was also that a geek stop. Sounds like an excellent project. I, I did a geek yeah. talk last month, right? So I, I believe that geek mm -hmm. also has a section on this. So if someone's interested, they can also it refer does, to yeah. that. But I'll drop it's... the other link as well. Great. Great. Thank you. All right, uh, Nicole. Nicole, are you here? Oh, wait, I can't hear you. It says you're not muted, though. <laughs> I don't know, Nicole. I can't hear you either. We'll circle back to you. Yeah, we'll circle back. I don't know what, what's up with that. OK. Uh, all right, we're going to work on the technical difficulties and then Jennifer. Yeah, hi. Um, hi. I'm, I joined the group an hour ago, so I am truly a newbie. Um, so um, one of the reasons I joined, I've been working with Glass for 25, 30 years, starting out 
long time ago um, in Brooklyn when the experimental glass workshop was in Little Italy. So that's how far back I go. But mostly I do flame working, but I like to make it into sculpture. So I do metalworking, I do jewelry, I do some soldering. Um, I do all sorts of stuff. But part of the reason I thought it would be interesting to join this group is because there are people who have skill sets that I don't have. Um, you know, for example, I tried welding once and it's not my cup of tea, but I'd love to, um, you know, work with somebody who does do welding and come up with a project that would combine both or woodworking. I don't really do woodworking, but there are all so many things you can do to combine glass with other mediums. And that to me is really exciting. So that's why I'm here. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. Yeah, absolutely. Um, collaborating with people who have different experiences in other mediums is a, is a great way to um, kind of learn more about what you what you're good at making and like to make and then also kind of expand your own skill set too so that's great okay Nicole let's uh let's see uh oh I think I hear you oh hello yes hello <laughs> okay hello everybody um my name is nicole berger um i have been in the uh, glass pipe industry since 2013 and collaboration is a huge part of this industry i'm actually at a friend's studio right now from collabing all day today um but for me, a lot of what I get from collaboration is um, learning because I feel like with flame working, a lot of the time it's a very like solitary thing and you have a tendency to just stay like either by yourself or with one other two, one or two other people. But when you start to work with others, your ideas expand, your techniques expand, you think of ideas that wouldn't just come to you alone and just like the progression of work and skill and technique just grow so much when you have insight from other people. So a lot of the time, um, collaboration helps with that, but then also, um, talking about social media, which is such a big, um, part of the artistic world today is like you're also when you do make pieces with people you're exposed to their audience so your audience grows as well with collaboration which I think is a a really good thing to note on because then people who have similar interests of work of yours can like finally see your own work um yeah I think that's I think that's good for now <laughs> That's some great point. So not only, are, you know, I've seen a lot of collaboration in the pipe world as well that expands not only, this, not only the skill, but you're right, like also collaboration and kind of like marketing as well and building an audience. That's a very collaborative um, kind of thing as well that's happening. All right. Thanks, Nicole. Sally. Yeah, I, um, I tried to share a couple collaborations on, you know, to drag your stuff on there, but it didn't seem to work. But um, one thing I, I like to do when I teach like at Penland, they have so many different, you know, things to do there. So I have my students collaborate with somebody in the hot shop. Usually they have to make two pieces, one for them, one for the other person, and maybe another one in case they mess up. And then they have to find somebody in another studio and collaborate like that. And then you know, it's really interesting to see what people choose and, you know, it's, you know, it gets people out of the studio there too, because you can just poof, stay in your studio. Um, I do a lot of co collaborations with artists. Um, they can't make the pieces that they want. And so they call me up and I make it for them. And so that's always interesting to jump into somebody else's head, you know, to learn like something like you want this bend to be all kinked up and, and messy looking, you know, <laughs> I'm like, okay, you know, so, you know, taking, 
taking yourself out of your comfort zone. Um, I also like to, um, George Kennard and I, um, we're going to be teaching a couple of times, um, once at Salem and once at Pittsburgh, and we do a flame, um, flame to furnace um, class. And what I really like when we teach that with a lathe around, like at Salem, we'll have a lathe. We'll take the piece and just chuck it up in the lathe. And all of a sudden, I don't know what you want to call it. Do you want to call it lamp working? Do you want to call it hot glass? I don't know. Um, but, you know, just going from the furnace to the lathe to the furnace to the lathe, I think is um, something really nice. Um, and I like working in the team like that. Um, but um, should I share a couple of things? Like, I don't think I can do that. Um, yes, if you're able to, uh, drop it in the chat. So if you have photos, what I did is um, yeah, how do you copy a photo. Uh, if, if you have it like on Facebook or on some online platform, you can go to it there and copy the link. Oh, copy the link. Okay. Yeah, that's probably <laughs> going to be the best way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's good. All right. I'll try to. We'll figure it. it out together collaboratively. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I just, I think there's a, um, you know, it's really exciting to see the collaborations happening now, especially between science and art. Um, I have a lot of um, art students that don't quite have it, but they're growing molds inside of glass. So I'm creating glass thing for, for their mold that a scientist created, you know, and then throw some neon in there too. You know, like, it's just like all these different things are finally coming together and maybe the, the walls between different things, like why do we call it, you know, um, fused glass and why do we call it lamp work and why do we call it all these different things why can't it just be glass why can't it just be metal why can't it just be you know um so i think we're bringing down those walls and that's nice okay I'll shut up. agreed and i just wanted to echo or amplify uh something that joe wrote joe lee wrote in the chat um, and he says he has a background in STEM and he brings up um, collaborations that are type of R&D uh, where knowledge is shared and built upon to further the field. Um, and so he engages in collaboration in that way in his practice, not so much collab between people, but more of a um, kind of a, a communal contribution to the field. So that's an interesting way to think about collaboration as well in kind of like a, a zoom out kind of perspective that kind of relates to what you were saying a little bit, Sally, with collaborating with scientists. Um, okay, uh, Chris Mosley. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Sweet. Okay. Hello. Hey, good. I'm, I'm glad I could catch this uh, being on the West Coast. Uh, I have a dinner in like a few hours, so it was like perfect timing. Uh, good to see everyone. Um, yeah, I think there's, for me, it seems like collaboration has come in stages. Um, I know when um, my earlier years, um, Salem and stuff, it was like experience, just like meeting people, getting to like go to their shop and hang out, learn their techniques see what they're doing, put it together, have a good time. Um, it really kind of like brought this like community, um, friendship, networking together. And that was, you know, like that was a real pure time of collaboration. Um, same with Joe Lee, you know, uh, later in my life, it's um, been like intellectual, like, hey, I need something machined. And, you know, you get that part machined and then you do the, the next process and then that sets up and then that goes to the next stages. Um, and now I'm at an interesting part where collaborations like I have a vision, I have an idea, I might um, CAD something out and seek out the person who can do it and pay them. So a lot of my collaborations now are like having a vision. I don't have time to um do some wood stuff or do this so i'm like boom where can i find this done with someone i am familiar with is it something that i have to send them a design or have a conversation is it somewhere that i have to like 
I can drive to and I can do visually show them what's the price, what's the time frame. And so now I think more as I enter into like the, the, the more professional, I would call more professional stage of my life. It's definitely like, like the resources and money and being like, okay, like I have, I have a show coming up and I need this wood thing made. And I'm like, who does wood? Okay. These are my resources. Bam. Can he knock this out in the time frame? How much are you going to charge me? Back in my mind, I'm like, okay, if, if it reaches to a certain time frame or in a certain price point, then I need to like go to the wood shop down the street, the maker space and do it here, or maybe find someone and have a backup. So it's now becoming more of like this balance of like figuring out like how does collaboration work with business and who, who, who can I go to with like the friend hookup or who can I just go to and be like, all right, I know they're going to give me a good price. They're going to deliver. And then also I'm doing this cut run next week and the person is fairly new so she can bring me bits and punnies. So there's like no charge. It's like, she's just down to like get the experience and like be a part of the process. So I'm like, yes, that's a good one. Cause everyone else wants to charge me $40 an hour. So it's at this point now where I think like, you know, it was fun in the beginning. It was all friend love. Everyone's welcoming to the studio. And now they're like, Oh, you make good money. I'm going to charge you. And then I'm like, no, where can I, why do I want to go back to like when I was a rookie and everyone just allowed me in the shop and things were great. And we were just doing things. And now I'm like figuring out like all these different out these, all these different like resources and things. So it's, it's become different because it's, it's fairly new in my life where now it's like, boom, you know, I had to like do a 1099 for the first time last year. And it was like, you know, when, and it was crazy. It was just like, it was up Nate at, um, at public glass in San Francisco. We knocked it out, but it was like, you know, I, I paid him a good bit of money and I was like, i have never done this before. And then I did taxes recently. And I'm like, I got to ask this dude for a 1099. I got to do all this. So now collaboration for me is like expanding to like what it would look like if like, you know, I employed people or have to go all this route. And, you know, from someone who started as definitely like, you know, a single artist and all this and that it's kind of now expanding because as you get bigger visions and bigger ideas and in more things, it's like, you can't do it all. So I think collaboration works in like scaling. Um, but now it's like at a time where like, you know, like everyone's got to pay bills. So in, in times valuable. So how do you find the balance where it works out for all parties? I think is like the, the new stage for me with collaboration. Absolutely. Some really good points there. Thanks so much for making the time to, to pop in on the call. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. The West Coast. Appreciate you guys. <laughs> yeah, back at you. All right, Madeline. Hey, I'm unmuted. Yeah. <laughs> hey, guys, I'm Madeline. Uh, I know most of you, but if you don't know me, I'm an artist and educator in Philadelphia. Um, thank you all for coming. It's great to see you. And um, for me, like collaboration, I am one of those people that will like spend all my time in my studio working by myself, um, flame working being an extremely solitary art form. So for me, collaboration is a chance to embrace like connecting with other people. Um, and a lot of my performance artwork uh, is collaborative. So for instance, like my connected breath series where people are blowing hot bubbles together. Um, it's literally like a collaboration of breath. Um, and I think that a lot of my work, it's, it's like I have a vision and I rely on other bodies to implement an action to kind of be part of it. So it's kind of, I feel like an orchestra conductor or something where I'm like, you stand there, you do this, you look this certain way, please. <laughs> um, but you can put your own spin on it. Like I give them a role and ask them to help me like, create a vision. Um, so I think it's sort of like, um, yeah, that's kind of how I think of it. And then like with, um, like for instance, right now I'm working on a performance piece coming up at Tyler where um, a group of people and I were spinning a large glass web and there's collaborative flame ring aspects there. Um, and I want everyone to sort of bring their own personality there and, and we're exploring relationships between one another on the torch and in hot glass. 
and kind of using Glass as like a format to explore um, explore that. Um, and one other uh, interesting kind of collaboration I'm doing right now, I'll talk about real quick is um, it's kind of a little unusual, but I'm collaborating with a, um, a chamber music group that got a grant from New Music or Chamber Music America. So they commissioned a quintet for, from a contemporary composer and she wrote a quintet based off of the act of glass of flame working. So I described her flame working and they knew about me making glass musical instruments. And I, I sent her videos of making different instruments and she created a musical composition based, based on that action of like, you know, blowing out, like flaring a trumpet uh, bell or popping holes in a flute or something like that. So um, that is a piece of music that they're going to play with a quintet. Um, and at the end, they're going to play it on the musical instruments that I make. So it's kind of an interesting, like cyclical collaboration where like a piece of music is inspired by flame working and flame working is going to be playing that piece of music. Um, so that was, that's a little funky and, and kind of wild <laughs> and out there. That sounds pretty cool. I can't even really imagine. So I'm looking forward to checking that out. Uh, David Willis. Hi. And hi, Lily. David, you are muted still. Can you guys hear me okay? I get yeah. some I get some weird reception here, so if it goes out, I'll just hop off. Um, but I do like uh, where Madeline was going with the, you know, I like having an opportunity to work with people I love. Um, and I find that to be really a huge bonus in my life um, and my work. And then also <clears throat> a lot of times um, working with people who, you know, aren't me, um, I get pushed outside of my comfort zone and try a lot of new things or things that maybe um, I wouldn't really feel were within my um, areas of experience, not necessarily within technical glass blowing, but just in my life. You know, if I'm working with someone and we're, you know, talking about things together that I haven't experienced, bringing that into my work is really creative and um, informative and I think teaches me a lot. Um, so those are two things I particularly enjoy. All right, thank you. Neil. Hi, Neil. Hi, all. Uh, thanks for having me. This is my first time um, joining these video sessions. I appreciate you all for having me. What's up, Chris? Hey. Um, so me, I am a uh, scientific glass blower um, in the aerospace industry, and I am an artist when I can be. Um, so a lot of the collaboration that that I really deal with on a day-to-day -day basis has to do with engineering and um, bringing a lot of skills together to make the product work. Um, so, you know, if I'm not as well-versed, say, in welding or, or electrical engineering, I will consult with my um, other engineering colleagues and maybe ask for a a hand in the project if I can like bring their talents on for what I need. Um, luckily in-house, you know, we have all those resources to make that happen. Um, and all the people I work with are very good about it and they're very, really great people to work with. Um, but it's also learning opportunities for me to learn from them, which is extraordinarily important because I'm, I mean, a lot of engineers don't really have experience with glass and vice versa. Um, so, you know, we all bring something to the table and, uh, yeah, that's just a little bit of what I deal with. Thanks, Neil. And, uh, and to kind of piggyback off that, um, there's a question in the chat that I wanted to just bring up. Do we, and is it useful to differentiate between collaboration as knowledge building and collaboration as subcontracting? subcontracting so say like outsourcing fabrication support <laughs> that kind of thing and what is the um do you have preferred terminology or do you draw lines in between those different types of collaboration is one a collaboration and one not um anybody have thoughts on any 
of those topics. Uh, and can I just ask too, Mose and Samantha, your hands are raised. If you are not interested in speaking right now, could you just um, untap the hand raise question, the hand raise uh, tab, just so that I can thank you. All right, and Nicole. And we can't hear you, Nicole. So, yeah, I don't know. Whatever you did last time worked. So just do that again. <laughs> so while you're working it out, I will just, I will add. Um, so I work as an artist and I also work as a fabricator. And when I work as a fabricator for other artists, I do not consider that collaboration because the way I think of collaboration is that I have an equal part with the other entities in the group. Um, and we share authorship and we, you know, we may divvy up the labor, but there's like sort of an authorship there um, that I would like to participate in as a collaborator if I'm calling it a collaboration. So in regards to fabrication, where I'm getting paid to execute somebody else's vision or collaborating with someone of the sciences or engineering, I consider that not to be a collaboration and myself to be performing um, a, a, a a job for somebody else and likewise when i hire somebody else to sub you know subcontract somebody to make a piece for me i'm very clear up front as whether i'm hiring somebody to just execute this design or whether it's a collaboration and if it's a collaboration then what are the responsibilities what's the division of labor and what is the in, the intellectual property value after um the when this project goes out into the world so yes hiring versus collaboration that's a good kind of way to differentiate it. Yeah. And that's just my personal um, thought on that. And I have to negotiate this every time I enter into a, fab a fabrication agreement with another artist, because some artists do want to include my name or something like that. And, and we work all of those details up, up front before anything gets made. And I think that's really important um, to a responsible thing to do before you enter into collaboration. Anastasia. Hi, Amy. I actually just wanted to ask Hi. you more of a follow-up on that question. Um, so with something where, let's say, I do you do, um, if I recall, you said just now you do commissions for people or people com can commission you as a fabricator. Um, do you, like, let's say that's a piece being sold. Is that also something you work out as if... Um, Will the money be up front or will it be um, something you get once the piece is sold? Uh, just out of curiosity, how you manage, how you navigate that. That's a really good uh, question. And, and for me personally, that actually, I think um, that's kind of where the line is with what I would regard as a collaboration or not, because when I'm fabricating, I'm getting paid. Um, there's no, you're going to pay me later. I'm getting paid. And, um, and somebody is hiring me to do a job and then they get the finished piece. They're the authors of it. And I, my responsibility is done. And then they take that piece and, and do what they will with it after it, it leaves my shop. Um, and I've already been paid for my part. So if it's a collaboration, like the collaboration I'm working on now with another artist in my own studio with my own work, we're equal partners, um, and uh, and so we agree ahead of time how we're going to split everything as far as division of labor, um, how we're going to kind of edit or veto each other's designs. And then also um, with, with regards to selling, how we're going to split that up. And we arranged all of that ahead of time where we each have a stake in the project that we both feel comfortable with and feels fair before we ever, you know, even started making work together. So so I get paid up front as a collaborator, but not as an artist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's a really good question. And Sally. Yeah, I'll just have to agree. I kind of do it like you do it. When I work for an artist that wants something, they pay me up front. Um, and I, a lot of times I will ask for a two scale sketch. I want a top view, side view, all the different views, because, you know, when you're doing something for somebody, you really have to make sure that you understand what's in their head. Because um, if you're not working together on it, you know, 
and you have to make sure you give them what they want. And actually, all day long here at the university, I make stuff from sketches and, you know, I have to do exactly what they want. And we get plus or minus three or point five millimeters in there. It's all part of the job. Yeah, I asked for um, CAD renderings and especially from artists, this is something I started doing recently where um, when you start getting into the big projects, it's really important to be able to communicate. And so um, the CAD space has been really great for that because um, you can have a, a piece that's rendered and then there's like no question. You can edit it virtually. There's no question about what it is I'm supposed to make. I'm just supposed to take this object from three dimensional space and make it into physical space. So it exists in physical space, that's the job. Yeah, go ahead, Sally. A new thing that's been happening to me here in the science world is people 3D image what they want because they want it to fit exactly into their hood. They want it to fit exactly into their manifold. They want this exactness to it. And so they 3D print it and it's really nice because then I have a 3D image of exactly what I'm supposed to make. So I can take my measurements on whatever corner I want to. And I just think as the 3D imaging keeps going, we're gonna get more of that and it's really wonderful. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. That's great technology. Um, I just wanted to touch on uh, a point Joe made. He said, in the hiring versus collaborating distinction, there's also consulting, which can be something a little different from both of those. Um, does anybody have any thoughts about uh, consulting or have done any consulting that you might be able to kind of shed some light um, on that subject? That would be interesting. Uh, uh, Let's go with Mose. So yeah, so last year um, I kind of branded myself or my business as being um, doing more consulting in like glass specialty. Um, it's a, uh, it's it just depends for me. It's like I'm trying to was trying to narrow it more into like getting like high paid jobs in in Silicon Valley up here where compared to like art it's a little bit different um in the art sense it's like for me it was like more trying to like find friends who wanted stuff like hey do you need someone to like turn for you do you need someone to like kind of like bring in my specialty and from like the um, the silicon valley like consulting i'm like trying to get like an engineer spot um and basically get paid like you know like good good money so it's in in a lot of that is based on like experience and resume so for me with the art it was like kind of like finding more of like the friends because like that's what's gonna like people know me as in where consulting with like um professionals it's like the resume in my work and the website are going to show because they don't know. They're just like, okay, who's this guy? And they're going to look at like resumes. What, what have you done? Who have you worked with? Um, where friends will be like, yeah, I've, I've worked with you. We've done this. So it's kind of like, it's still fairly new to me, but it's like, I feel like you can't like, for me, I've had to pick one because trying to balance between the two, it's like, you want to get the, like, if you want to get the high gigs, you can't kind of like, you can't throw those like, the, the the friends deals on the resume because then they're going to look at you as an artist and not as someone who's going to be like a consultant in the professional world um so it's kind of like when that happens um you either if you're going to do the high ones don't bother putting the artistic stuff on there because the engineers and the scientists are going to see that in in my world they're not necessarily going to be like okay i need to hire you here um and vice versa, maybe with the friends, it might be a little bit better because they're friends and they don't care. Um, but trying to have like a lot of art stuff on my resume to doing the consultant for professional stuff hasn't necessarily worked out that well for me, where it's just like I kind of need to stick to like the more professional stuff um, on the resume to stick in that in that world, because then they'll just kind of um, try to lowball you and kind of talk you down, like talk down to you as being like an artist. And I've had a lot of engineers kind of be like, oh, you're just the artist. Um, and that hasn't necessarily felt the best. So it's like, for me, I'm like, you know, I'm trying to walk both lines. Um, and that's why I'm kind of like going back to school for more things and stuff like that, because 
when you're trying to consult in that world, it's, um, it's just, they're, they, it's just like, they got a different attitude about it. Um, they, you know, they're like, Oh, you're just an artist on the hippy dippy mountain making pipes or doing whatever. Um, and I've had a lot of different, a weird, a lot of different shots called at me. And like I said, it's, it's in my world, it's been kind of a little discouraging. And so I try to now, um, I'm trying to clean it up a little more for the like professionalism so it doesn't happen or I get lowballed for a price. Good call. Lessons learned, right? You can yeah, make multiple absolutely. resumes too for different, you know, different um, opportunities. So it sounds like that you're working on building that, which is great. Yeah. Um, Neil. Yeah. So I think with consulting, you really need to know, yourself your capabilities and you need to be able to charge accordingly for it and you also need to know um, what exactly the person or the other entity is looking for out of your consultation and more importantly they also need to understand what they're asking of you anecdotally i was recently approached by this gentleman who had a design for an indestructible bong he wanted to bring on a manufacturing engineer to design a process and then help manufacture this, this piece. Well, this, this gentleman, a made me sign an NDA, which I obliged. And he then wouldn't show or share photographs of his design with me, um, in fear that I would rip him off. But so he was describing all of these, like, you know, threaded joints that will, fit on the top so you can add and subtract components and in my head i'm just thinking well that kind of with with those fragile components it's no longer an indestructible piece so they don't know necessarily like the limitations of the material to under to like actually ask decent questions and then additionally this gentleman didn't quite understand production limitations he thought that you know, one or two people were capable of making 60 finished pieces in a day, which is quite laughable. Um, that's a lot of work. So, you know, it, I, with that, I realized, you know, this guy's wasting my time. He's trying to act like he knows a lot about the pipe game, um, which, you know, in reality, being on both sides of scientific and you know um degenerate artistry it's it, you can see what people's holes in their story and you can't adequately help them because yeah they don't know what they're asking of you so it, it it's really important that you know your capabilities and if you can add to the team or not and maybe send them in a different direction that's about it <laughs> good point good point thanks neil uh we're going to do a few more uh, folks here, let a few more folks respond, and then I'm going to pass it over to Madeline. So, Anastasia. Hi. Um, mine is more of a story about, um, I guess, finding out what my shortcomings were through the process of doing a kind of commission work. Um, so, this was right before the pandemic hit, I basically had flyers up saying that I was, um, for a certain rate, uh, I could do mold making for any seniors that had thesis shows. And that way, um, I thought it would be a good way for me to both gain skill and experience working with different things and not just the things that I wanna make and also a way to like, um, be collaborative and just um, work with people. And that and I thought that would be nice because it would be serving my community of glass workers uh, for their thesis shows. Um, I thought I was much better than I was. I was coming, even though I was coming up with new ideas on how to make molds for things, I was also coming up with new problems um some of them worked out really good some of them didn't and I kind of it was a learning process for me but also I I feel a little bad that I charged money for that learning process if that makes sense but um it was still um uh, materials and time and I don't know I just have a lot of uh not a lot but like some knowledge as to what it was like 
now. So I don't know. That's my story. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing. I mean, there's always something to learn from every experience, right? So, yeah. All right, um, Sally. Yeah, um, here at um, the university, I work at two universities and we do charge people um, for consulting. I give them a free half hour. And then after that, they pay the going rate, whatever that rate is for them. Um, we have different rates if they're outside or inside. And I'm sorry to hear that um, people look at artists I have, I've never had the experience of an engineer or a scientist look at the art and kind of put you down. I've had them put me down because I'm a woman. They're like, oh, you can do that? Really? Ah, oh, that's interesting. You can do that. But I've never had them put me down with the artist stuff. I don't know if I've ever been accepted in the scientific glass blowing world because I do art, and I've never been accepted in the artistic world because I do scientific, but... Um, those engineers, they think, well, maybe you can make this molecule for somebody who's graduating that. And I'm going, yeah, let's do that. You know, like um, maybe show your artwork um, off a little bit more, actually. Um, and maybe they'll respect it more. This is just my thought. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. I do the opposite thing. I, um, on my art website, I hide my fabrication work and all of those, you know, projects. So those are not visible to anybody and then you need a secret link to be able to access it on my, on my, uh, website. So it's sort of the opposite. <laughs> um, okay. David. I think well, hi. Hey, Sally, will you share what your sliding scale rates are? Yeah, here at um, the University of Massachusetts for outside work, I do $110 an hour, and that includes private lessons. And so sometimes um, different... Sally! Hi! <laughs> oh, this Sally. <laughs> so sometimes um, different um, glass blowing facilities hire me to come teach, go to that facility and teach. So they pay $110 for me to travel there and teach them. Or professors come here, they want to learn glass blowing in a private setting, so they pay 110. Um, then it's 60 for um, chemistry, um, phys you know, physics, engineering, um, to get anything fabricated that they want. Um, up in um, Vermont, it's cheaper. I don't know why, because it's more expensive to live there. Um, but there they pay $70 outside rate in a 40 $40 inside rate. Wow, that seems really reasonable. I think I pay plumbers more than that. Right, I, yeah, I know. I, I get a lot of artists that just do their, you know, they just send the artwork right through the glass blowing shop because I don't have time to do that in my home studio. So I I'm not telling anyone what your rates are because mine are higher. Um, but what I was going <laughs> to say is that, uh, you know, for for consulting a lot, you know, I don't get a lot of uh, people approaching me that I don't know. So most of the consulting I do is with people that have been clients. Um, and I generally kind of give that away until we're actually working on the job because a lot of it is, is about like feasibility. Can we do this? How would we do this? What would be the, you know, time requirements? And then um, once we're in, then I charge hourly and everything gets considered. But I really haven't. Um, so that's kind of maybe my bad on businessing. Um, and maybe if I was dealing with strangers, I would just automatically charge like a design fee or something like that that other people charge. So those were my thoughts. Thank you both. Um, okay, let's hear from Lydia, and then I'm going to pass it over to Madeline. So, Lydia, welcome back, Lydia. Hi, uh, glad to be back. Um, just, just an addition on the Neil story. I had that guy come and uh, try to consult with me about that, and he also tried to get me to sign an NDA. <laughs> and actually, the other guy he was with who knew me... Um, 
basically made him compensate me for wasting my time because he knew that it was bullshit. So it was just um, more amusing that both of us here in town got to talk. It was it was Jacob, right? It, like his name was Jacob, big old beard, like. Big I beard, thought you said right? I. I don't I don't know his name. I I don't even remember his name honestly. This was like this it's sad to say this was maybe like 2 weeks ago. Um th- two or three is when I <laughs> just stopped. But like yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> He's like, "Oh, do you know there's a yeah. market for people making $100,000 bongs?" Like <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the glass blowing world is Sorry. a small small oh. world. Well, that's it. It's a small oh, it world. Sure like is. we, despite you know, to to piggyback off of what Mr. Mosley was saying about, and Sally Prash brought up too about you know being the 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 dumb artist. It's it doesn't work like that, and it it's all like a a personal perception whether or not people value aesthetics and nice good work. It's it's a whole bunch of things, you know. I mean, people can be right and left brained. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that we're really finding out from hearing some of these stories is there's just a whole range of different experiences that people, you know, experience uh, in collaborating and, and consulting and fabrication. So it's it's really interesting and, and kind of comforting to hear that everybody kind of goes through all these uh, range of um, experiences. So thanks all for sharing. Um, so, uh, I'm going to hand this over to Madeline right now and we're going to continue on, um, talking about collaboration. So Madeline. Cool. Um, so we've been talking a little bit about different kinds of collaborations, but I just love to ask, um, if anyone has any other interesting examples of collaborations that they want to share with the group, um, just kind of a way to get like a inspiration exchange. Um, it can be part of our resource exchange. So if you have any you want to share or you want to drop some into the chat, um, one, one thing that I thought was pretty cool, um, was like Simone Cristani did this like Boro in the hot shop, um, project several years ago at Corning, I think it was. Um, and that was really neat. Cause it's like literally like working off a Boro blow pipe. Um, and, and it was quite a collaborative process, even though I would say that like he was the gaffer in that sense. Um, so yeah, let's, let's open it up. Um, Lydia. Hi, sorry, I forgot to um, take that down. Sorry. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry, I got it. All right, um, Beth. Hey. Hi. <laughs> um, I think it's interesting um, that we've been working in Corning for a few months. Uh, we have a new group that uh, Claire Kelly has put together. And it's really a mentoring group. So if it's a whole range of experience, it's a whole range of, you know, abilities. And we're really there to set goals and then find out who can help us with those goals. So you want to build a website. Who's done that recently? Who has advice? And uh, we've just started, but it's been really useful especially with the pandemic. So many of us are so isolated and it's a great way to find out that a lot of us share some of the same anxieties or concerns or, you know, wanting to do different things. So just thought I'd throw that in as a different kind of collaboration. That's wonderful, Beth. Thanks for sharing. Is it something that's open to new people or is it like a closed group or? Nope, it's totally open. Cool. Would you be able to, to link that in the chat if you don't mind? Um, actually, it's in person. Oh, okay. So if, I don't know, <laughs> if you come to Corning. <laughs> if you come to Corning, we'll check it out. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. It's nice to keep it small, but so far anybody who's, in Corning is invited, so. Nice. Awesome. Uh, Amy. 
Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to mention before we get too far off this previous topic that I just dropped in the chat a link to a book by um, Glenn Adamson and Julia Bryan Wilson that I found interesting uh, in in it, uh, Glenn Adamson um, postulates about this idea of like, you know, the contemporary art workshop and about how in contemporary art, the artist is more of a director a lot of times and, and, um, and hires fabricators and has like a workshop. This is nothing new, you know, has a workshop, a team of people making the work. And, um, and so entertained in the book is how to, how to um, possibly address that issue and, um, kind of get away from this idea of like the artist genius and, and acknowledge the fact that there are actually many people who are producing this work. And he suggests maybe doing like a, at the end of a movie, how there's a credit reel that lists everybody's contribution by name and how potentially that could work for scenarios where there's like a, an artwork is a big production or a show is a big production to give everybody credit as a fabricator, not as a collaborator, but as a type of, collab uh, a type of collabor collaborator in fabrication. Yeah, that's a really cool reference. Thanks, Amy. And that ties back into the question of fabrication versus hiring versus collaboration. Jennifer. Yeah, um, along those lines, I've found over the years that I've been able to collaborate with people on materials and supplies. Uh, for example, making pattern bars in the furnace. Um, that's been kind of beyond my skill set, but still in all, I've worked with people on that and we share the end results or making uh, vitrograph pulls, for example. Again, that's something that can be shared. They can pull, you know, so many pieces that you can't use it, it all up. Um, or also if someone has a huge kiln and you need a huge kiln to complete a project. I found that has been great and people are very open to, uh, you know, sharing their resources and uh, letting you, you know, exchange. Oh, I'll give you X, you know, I'll give you some borrow glass, but can you provide some, uh, you know, frit or, or whatever it is, even little things has really been helpful over the years. That's all. Thanks, Jennifer. Sure. I think that that's like kind of some of the best parts of being in like a shared studio or teaching in a university or something where you have access to a lot of people and there's a sort of spirit of generosity when it's at its best. Amy. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to just mention that as an educator, um, collaboration is something that it, it has been like very fruitful as an educator and I worked at urban glass for a lot of years where I would get kind of like introduced to um, an artist who was completely different from me, like an algorithm sculptor or like a, a printmaker or a photographer or something like that. And then we would have to find some common ground and through that, just getting to know each other and working in the studio and finding some common ground, we would develop a workshop that we would then turn into a class and invite other people kind of to collaborate with us on some crazy project. And that went on in many iterations for quite a few years. And I got to work with a lot of people outside my discipline. Um, and it resulted in some like pretty crazy work that um, I think for all the participants. So um, I think looking outside the glass world to uh, collaborate with other people is, is just a, um, a really great thing to do if you're, if you're able to. Absolutely. Getting an outsider perspective can help you see glass in a new way. That's how I feel, at least. Davis. Also, so for someone myself who doesn't collaborate that often, I think one of my things where I'm jumping in, like my hard to jump off point is that I also want to do a lot of things like with wood and metal and all that stuff. So I think like, oh, I'll kind of do it myself. So it's nice to have make those decisions like for example my dad is a woodworker and we have like a table where i made a glass inlay and he made the table and we're both really busy too which is the other thing and it's it was a very fun meaningful collaboration um but not something that i can like do all the time because it's not going to like fit in like with my financial needs i guess um so yeah, it's kind of hard to let go of control, I guess, is a good thing that collaboration brings to get into 
uh, out of your comfort zone, kind of. Um, but also, it's not always like the most feasible thing if you're like, because I honestly think most of what I want done is like something I want to pay someone for because we're all living through this very important time where we notice how important it is to pay people what they deserve to get paid. So, side note. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Davis. Um, Chris. So as Davis was saying that, it just kind of like made me um, think about something. Also, like kind of adding in the, that whole sense of like, you know, you want to pay people for the time. Um, I think sometimes like like the spirit, right? Like it's for me, I think if I get it's it's in the spirit of like wanting to be playful in, in figuring out the time and creating the time. You know, and it's like, hey, Neil, like me and him are both in California. We 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 hung out. It's like I'm gonna send you something. Throw this on there. We'll make it work. And I think it's like getting in that that spirited mindset of like, hey, let's just do this. Let's try something new. Where you know, like right now, it's such a you like important time where things are time is money and all these things are you know like extra COVID tax you know and it's in it's in it's i think making people be kind of this one track mind but now like hearing all the different people you know all you guys talk about it it's you know it's it's bringing me to the point of like getting in in the spirit of wanting to get back in the playfulness of just creating art and all that so i think like maybe that's like when you when you when you get in that mindset that's what you attract right and I think because I have gotten the, the mindset, it's like, oh, OK, people are like straight to the point. So maybe like the mindset of how we we how we brand ourselves, how we come off, how we do things, maybe setting aside time for play um, in experiment um, and finding those people who are also willing to take the time to do that is um, something that, you know, I think just hearing from everyone something that I think I can make time for in my life now. Um, just, you know, just having the conversation, um, I think is an important part of, you know, happiness. Like, why did I become a glass blower? Why did I do this? It wasn't to do the things I'm doing necessarily now. It was just to enjoy glass and make and have fun. So sometimes, yeah, you just got to get back to like having fun and being playful. Absolutely. I think it's really important to set aside time for play. Otherwise, you might forget what you're doing or why you're doing it. Jen, love to hear from you. Hi, sorry. This is maybe a little bit of off the topic, but I was like, oh, I should say this. I should say this for like the last 30 minutes. So I'm happy to say. Uh, I just wanted to uh, introduce my project in a while where I'm working. I'm teaching at Sheridan College in Ontario, Canada. Um, and then I'm teaching playmaking. Um, it's a four-year program. In the first year, we just learn everything, including casting and hot shop gospel and everything. But the second year, they actually majored in one thing. And then usually five to eight people major in playmaking every year. So I have those people. And then and we start to create something solid and more like a figurative things. And then there's a weekly assignment, which is more technical. So you have to make some small things every week. But at the same time, you have a little bit bigger project, which is a seven week long project assigned for like making something narrative. And then people, students usually get a little confused and they ended up with making a tiny little small thing and that's it. So in order to encourage them not to just like stay there, what I designed in a side way was like making a small group project, uh, still very figurative. Everyone should make one solid figures, but then that all has to be come together to create some scene sceneries. So first year it was, um, so we actually kind of like um, brainstorming together to figure out the scene as well. First year, we had uh, some of the things like, oh, what about the holiday figures, like Santas or um, pumpkins and everything. And then someone said, what about we have a feast? And then ended up we having a holiday figures feast, which is like we are feasting 
all those figures, like uh, we chop up cupid and then sent us and then pumpkins and slice them and eating and having a great party out of it, which was actually very awkward. But then, then I actually found that it's quite interesting because not only just like bring those figures together, they actually start to create their own stories. Right? So it was a sort of like also developing how to develop themes together. So it was actually partly um, in double meaning in some sense technically and also like conceptually, I would say it was very collaborative. And then the next year, uh, people like the underwater figures like fish, they wanted to make octopuses. So yes, okay, we will just make some underwater. Uh, theme. And then the third year, uh, someone was very into Pokemon, so we decided to design all their own Pokemon. And then there's a two figure, one was Kun, which is our studio head uh, teaching concepts. And then uh, the other one is me, uh, mostly teaching techniques, and we are fighting <laughs> on each side over techniques or concepts, or we're kind of arguing. With those uh, minions, minion Pokemons. So, 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 so far, that's actually our collaborative uh, group work. Um, and then I just wanted to share it with you. Thanks, Jin. Uh, that sounds like such a fun project for a class. The pictures are really cute. So, all right, I'll pass it over to Sally and then I'll introduce um, the next question. Sally. Well, um, I know um, down at Penland, they have a time period, I think it's between winter session and spring session, where you could actually rent the studio. And a couple of times, and Beth was a part of this, we rented the studio. We just got a group of people together and just went down there and just had fun. We didn't have to make anything. We didn't have any schedule. Um, it was it was really good. And so kind of coming back to that fun thing and um, and then also one thing I do in my classes, um, in my longer classes, I have people make um, an orchestra. They have to um, make an instrument and play together. And if they have enough time, they have to make an instrument that they play with somebody else. So um, one time Miles Dreyer, who has passed away, we made um, flutes so that when we played the flutes, we were cheek to cheek. You know, it was really cute. So you can you know, incorporate, try to get your students to collaborate with each other, doing kind of fun things like that. And I liked what you said, Jen, about what you did with your students. <laughs> yeah. I love it. That's my kind of instrument. <laughs> it's so cool. <laughs> Um, all right, I'm going to delve into the next topic. Um, and well, this is just branching off of what we were talking about, but we can definitely circle back if anyone has other things to say. And I just wanted to ask the question, um, like, how do you negotiate a collaboration? And this has come up a little bit um, tangentially, but like, you know, if, if you have a collaboration with someone, like, is it sort of free form? Is it, do you have like a contract? Um, is it kind of like a duet between someone? Are you making a totally new body of work? Um, and I'm just curious, cause I know like diff every different collaboration is going to have a different kind of thing. So, um, for me, for instance, like I don't do a lot of objects for collaboration. Like I've never made like a, an object, you know, I, I do performance or video or music collaboration. So for me, um, it's sort of like free form and I, I often have like ownership and, and will ask people to, to do their sort of a score of movements. Um, but I'm really curious about like what other people think about that. Um, and, uh, Amy, I see your hands raised. Yeah, real quick. I just wanted to to tell you all real quick, um, so I'm currently working with Nicholas Turan, who is a, um, a in the ceramics field, and we thought we've been following each other on Instagram for a number of years, and just you know fans of each other's work with the likes and stuff like that. And then about um, I don't know, sometime last year, he messaged me and was just like, "Hey, do you want to collaborate?" And it it just started really informal. It turned out we were both in New York. We both had studios nearby. And we just kind of took it from there. But we, you know, even though we're kind of like in close proximity, we wouldn't have met without, um, you know, knowing each other's work from Instagram. So that's a really valuable tool. And, and that's, you know, without that, I wouldn't be collaborating with this awesome artist right now. 
That's so cool. I love when that kind of thing happens. Just like it can snowball into a creative, a massive creative thing. Well, and also like, you know, you can make like career long friends that way too, which, which is really great. So, um, yeah. Absolutely. Does anyone else want to share about like, like, I'm curious, like if someone has a piece that they're like going to sell, like, do you like decide ahead of time? Like, like who gets what percentage or Samantha? Hey, hi guys. Hi again. So I have two situations. Um, one is the one that I mentioned earlier where I have a friend making these spoons for me. Um, I pretty much just asked him like what he expected up front. His number and my number were exactly the same. So that was super easy. Um, I've also sent him random like little stuff and he's put it on pieces he was working on. And our agreement there was that we'd split it 50, 50. Um, I have a girlfriend who takes my pendants and actually builds out nice jewelry. And we either, I either tell her like, you sell it, it's usually 50, 50, but if it's something special, um, I'll be like, okay, each pen, it's $15. You just take the difference. That's all that I want for like my piece of it. So I think like just having that open communication is really important. And, um, also kind of sticking firm to what you need at the time. So if you know that like you spent the time and effort and you need a certain amount, I would say like, just try to like make sure that you uh, that you like advocate for yourself for whatever you think your time and energy is worth. Awesome. Thanks, Samantha. Lydia. Oh, you're muted. There it is. Hello. Um, so this is something that's definitely come up in my life pretty recently. Um, so there's Glass Vegas recently. I sent um, some components to one of my friends to make a collab to try to sell there. How we negotiated the pricing on it is, um, at least in pipe, it's generally understood that it's a 50-50 split. Um, there are definitely occasions of people not being clear about that and things getting weird. Um, but there's also certainly been occasions where like, it, it seems like it would be easier for you to figure out what exactly the amount of money that you spent on your prep is worth and how much you minimum need for that. So like, you know, I want something, you want it to sell for a certain amount of money at retail, but if you're going to a trade show, it's probably gonna sell for around wholesale, which if it's a collab piece, it's going to be more than just like regular wholesale at 50%, it's probably closer to like, I feel like it's more like 60% of the re 60 to 65% of the retail price, um, which, so how I've always negotiated that is if I'm sending little components, like little peaches or something, I have a set price for how much I want for every little thing. And that wholesale price needs to at least meet that, which actually caused one of my collaborators to have to up their prices on their stuff, which wound up being a positive thing for them. Um, so that's, Kind of how we negotiate that. I feel like with most of the time, most of the time when I have that conversation, it seems to be very upfront, like, oh, it's 50-50. Um, and then later on, if there's like a question about how much to sell it for later, or there's a negotiation, like say at a trade show and you're not there, I've always had people just text me and I always just make sure that I'm staring at my phone the whole time during a trade show in, in case someone with a collab is negotiating with a buyer. So that's... How I've handled that. Cool. Thanks, Lydia. I'm still getting the hang of me unmuting myself. <laughs> um, I see we got some things in the chat. Yeah, like what about like does skill level ever like um is that ever a factor in collaboration? Um, is it ever like, you know, time spent, one person spends a lot more time than another person? Um, or I even heard an example where um, someone, there was a collaboration and whoever had more like Instagram followers got more of the proceeds, which I thought was really interesting because that's like a marketing tool, right? Um, 
So yeah, I'm I'm kind of curious about that. So I say I see um let's see. Joe Lee says maybe not specific just to glass, but there are me mechanisms like Creative Commons or open source licenses where one can release something that is implicitly intended for collaboration. This might be something tangential to what we're talking about, but it's an interesting model. Yeah, for negotiating collaboration. Yeah, I think that it, you know, for me, I really enjoy collaboration that's like um, free form open and, and more of that aspect of play and just messing around with someone. And I find really amazing things come up in that sense. But then again, I don't like sell a whole lot of um, work that's collaborative. Um, Amy. Hi, yeah, two things. I use the Creative Commons licensing for um, the open source designs that I make for 3D printed tools that are available on the resource exchange. So there's like a Polariscope in a, um, a 3D printed face mask port. And those files are open for anybody to use. And there's been some um, kind of unexpected collaborations. I, I posted the file for the 3D printed face mask port. It's like a little port you put in your, your mask so you can you know put your blow hose on it. And a student at um, uh, uh, a university in Florida made like a how-to video. And then posted that to the to the resource exchange. So that was kind of like a really nice kind of like um, almost like a response video to that open source file. So yeah, I, I love it when that kind of thing happens. And whenever I release anything open source, it's with the anticipation that other people will be using it and then maybe have some thoughts and that will lead to some other hopefully open source contribution to the community. That's so cool. That makes me think of, this is sort of silly, but like on TikTok, there's this um, like a function where you can duet someone's video. So like you take their video and it's playing right besides yours and you're often like, you're responding somehow to it. So there's like some really interesting things that come up with that where like people can create a whole musical composition or like other sorts of things. Um, and very, I've had some interesting responses to my videos <laughs> personally on there. Um, but I, that's a really cool way that like technology can be part of collaboration, I feel like, and kind of be in that, um, in the cyberspace sphere. Um, I'm curious if anyone has anything they want to add about like, how do, how do you start a collaboration or how would you like to start a collaboration or how has a collaboration started? Like, if there's someone you want to collaborate with, like, how do you approach them or can you, do you ever get like scared to approach them or I'm, yeah, I'm curious, uh, Lydia. Um, when I have an idea for, a, usually how I approach a collaboration is if I come up with an idea for something, uh, with something, somebody I know, um, does like, I'll just be like, Hey, so-and-so, if I sent you these, I feel like this would be a good idea. Do you have anything to add to that? And then we'll like discuss it for a little bit and then I'll send them the thing or we'll go in person and club. But I usually mostly just hit up my friends that I already know in person about it that I've met because talking to strangers on the internet is scary um, for that kind of thing. Um, I've, you know, I've had people hit me up with stuff and like, you know, depending on whether or not like I feel like I can do it is usually how I like decide whether or not I'm going to do it. But yeah. Also scheduling is definitely a big issue that can be a big, um, yeah. Not only do you have to deal with your own schedule, but another artist's schedule, Sally. Well, a lot of times I try to get to know the person that I want to collaborate with. Um, you know, everybody's doing different things and I want to find out well, what are they about? You know, like I have my idea, but what is what is in their heads? And um, George, George Cannery, who I teach with um, quite often, he's always like, Sally, what do you want to make? We'll just do whatever you want. But then there has to be, like, I'm like, George, we have to do something that's in your head, too. You know, like, we have to bring this together. And um, so I took George um, walking down the Corny Museum of Glass and looked at work. And I said, okay, wh what do you want to start with? You know, and I don't know if you've seen his video of the four-foot goblet. No? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I I have watched it probably a hundred times and I'm still on the edge of my seat when I'm watching it. It was a 
it was, it's, if you look up on the Corning website, you'll find it. Um, I'm not sure what it's listed at, but he made a four foot goblet, right? And he's like, Sally, I want to put chains on these goblets. I want you to flame work this. I want you to do this. I want you to make swans. And when he said, I want you to make swans, I'm like, oh my God, he wants me to make swans. But it's something that I would never do, right? But I did it for George. And so then we have a collaboration, right? You know, it's just, sometimes you just have to get into somebody else's head and they have to get into your head and then it meshes together and you come up with something weird. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. I love that as an example of like collaboration as a way of playing or like forcing yourself to do something new, get, get outside your comfort zone. And at first it might, it might feel like a horrible idea, but then in my experience, more often than not, like it, it ends up usually being something good, even though you might not realize it in the moment. <laughs> um, yeah, I agree with Amy about like, it's awesome to seek out artists who are doing something completely different from you and trying to like find common ground. That's like, that's a way that I, I feel like you can get a whole new perspective on like whatever you're trying to do. Um, and like, for me, for instance, like the negotiate, like the collaboration I'm doing now with the chamber music piece, um, like I'm, I was working with the composer and we were meeting and I was like playing instruments for her and explaining the process. And she wrote the composition and then like the flout, the flautist, the flute player in the group, she's the one who like got the grant and did all the grant application to get the money to like make this composition. So like that was sort of the nitty gritty. And like, there are other members of the chamber music group that are like doing different things. So, so I feel like sometimes there's like a hierarchy of like collaboration and sometimes it's like common ground and equal ground. Um, oh, cool. So, oh, nice. Got a link here. Um, uh, anyone have uh, any examples of what platforms you use for collaboration? Have you ever met, not met someone you've collaborated with? Um, we're getting to, it's around 8.35 now, so we'll probably start wrapping up pretty soon. Um, and I just wanna, just wanna ask like, um, probably our final question that I'd wanna touch on before we wrap up is, um, if anyone has any ideas of like extreme collaborations they'd like to see in the future, or like what's your dream collaboration? Um, is there like an example of like an ultimate collaboration scenario that would be really interesting? Sally. Well, one thing we were talking about right at the beginning is um, if you're coming to the International Flame Working Conference, I would like you to bring something that creates sound. All right. And um, at the beginning of my demonstration on Saturday, we'll all make sound. I'm so excited. I've got to make like a glass whoopee cushion or something. <laughs> Something unheard of. Um, Davis. <laughs> a little off topic, but I'd like to see the Philly Streets Departments collaborate with the Horticultural Society because that needs to happen. Um, that's an amazing idea. Yes, <laughs> that needs to happen. <laughs> yeah. and, and glass artists all thrown in there too and ceramic and, you know, <laughs> landscape artists too. Yes. Oh, great. Anything, anything else anyone wants to add to the chat or, or add to the conversation? Yeah, Sally. You know, can I just, just say a couple kind of advertisement things? Um, the Glass Life Forum show in Brockton, Massachusetts, they're going to have a reception on April 2nd. And so if you go to the Fuller Museum of Glass, um, I'll try to get that in the chat. Um, you buy tickets to the reception, but it, it's, it's such an excellent show this year. I just, I'm so psyched about it. Um, so that's a cool thing. It is a really good show, and there's some amazing flame working representation in that show. I got to say, definitely. Everyone should check it out. Um, so I think I'm going to pass it on back to Amy to wrap it up here. Um, but if there's anything anyone wants to say that they haven't really gotten a chance to say yet, please raise your hand or feel free to pop it in the chat. And we'd love to just have it in our in our um, conversation record. 
All right. Well, thank you all so much. This uh, it's always interesting and exciting to hear what this group has to say. And tonight was no exception. So thank you all so much for contributing um, and also, uh, you know, dropping links in the chat. Uh, Madeline and I will compile all of these into meeting notes, which will be available um, in the resource exchange. And you'll, you'll get an email link to all of that. And our, uh, I just wanted to mention, too, that the recording for meeting number two is now available. Um, and also the meeting notes for um, meetings one and two are available in the, in the resource exchange as well on geeks.glass. So um, feel free to check out any of those if you've missed any of those meetings or were curious. We had some really great discussions. So um, you can kind of get caught up. And also, I just wanted to um, kind of uh, plant a little seed for our next meeting, which will be in May, I believe. Um, and we are going, the topic that we're going to be addressing is the role of, of uh, technology in flame working. There's like a lot of different ways that we could think about that. So um, just to kind of plant the seed with you all, more info to come on that. But I look forward to hopefully seeing you all again. Uh, mm -hmm. in May for our next Flame Affinity meeting. So, thank you all so much for joining us and uh, hope you all have a good rest of the night. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Hey thank guys. You so, so great to see you. Hey, this is Emily from Geeks, aka the Glass Education Exchange. Geeks is an online platform connecting people and sharing materials in the collective field of glass education. That's a bit of a mouthful. So what does it actually mean? Geeks create supportive spaces outside of traditional academic structures to offer community building programming and resources. Programs like the Flame Affinity Group offer a space for constructive dialogue between practitioners in the field. We're hoping to nudge the field of glass into its next generation through new models of community support. This recording is also available through one of our initiatives, the Glass Resource Exchange. The Glass Resource Exchange is a user-contributed library collecting and sharing educational material like articles, supply lists, videos, and more. We're hoping to see it grow as a common resource supporting Glass teaching and learning. Want to support geeks? Small donations really help us continue building our communal programming. Alternatively, you can subscribe to our lecture series featuring outstanding Glass artists and researchers. Learn more at geeks.glass slash support. Thanks for watching. Want updates on new Geeks programs and resources? Follow at Geeks Glass on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, or visit our website, geeks.glass. Thanks again, and stay tuned. <laughs>